Thank you, Darrell, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. May God forgive him for embellishing it as much as he did, and God forgive me even more for enjoying it as much as I did. I... <laughs> oh, let me say good evening to all of you. Uh, it is good to be here. I, I am just delighted I made it in one piece. Never let it be said that you can't learn something new each day. I, uh, the experience of just being here today uh, taught me something new. I flew in from Houston this day and um, caught an Uber at the airport, got in it, and uh, the Uber driver took me to my house, and I got my little bag out of the back of it, and once I got in the house, I realized that I left my cell phone in the Uber. Okay, I don't have a landline. I don't know who has landlines these days, but I don't have a landline, so I couldn't call her, and so I waited at the door for about 15 minutes to see if she would come back and see if she would see my phone in the back seat there, and she didn't come. So I had this great technology idea, Jimmy. I have this app on my iPad that says, Find My Phone. Okay, so I, I haven't used it before. I said, hey, I, I, you know, I might as well do it. So I went in and found my iPhone, and it came up that she was 3.8 miles away in this neighborhood. So I jumped in the car to go find my iPhone. And, you know, and it, 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 it gives you the little arrows, you know, where the phone is and where you are, you know. So, I mean, technology, is this a great country or what? I mean, technology had me going, you know, to the dock where my iPhone was, you know. And, and I get halfway there, then I see the dot coming back my way, you know. She's moving, coming back to where I left. So I turn around, and I'm coming back, and anyway, it was a mess. But I did catch up with her. She came back to the house and left my, and I, you know, I, I only bring it to tell me when to sit down. So you all are fortunate tonight that uh, I have something to tell me when to sit down. But. It was a great day, and I am just delighted. As I look at this program, I am just amazed at the people who are here, uh, the scholars, the teachers, the, the uh, uh, rabbis, the, the uh, ministers, all, all the people who are here for this uh, great conference. Thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to lead you in worship tonight. Let's pray. In Christ, there is no east or west. In him, no south or north. But one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ, now meet east and west. And in him, Meet south and north, all Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. Dear Lord, we indeed come tonight knowing that we are one in you. Come now and bind our hearts together so that we may do what you would have us do. In Christ's name I pray, amen. As I was about to enter my first year at Perkins School of Theology in, at SMU in Dallas, Texas, the, the year was 1969. I can't believe it's almost 50 years that I entered seminary. But when I was about to enter, there was an African-American theologian by the name of James Cone, C-O-N-E, who became the central figure in the development of a new movement called liberation theology. I see a lot of young folks here who may not be familiar with that, but 
I, I, I invite you, I commend you to Google James Cone because his work is still influential. So he, he wrote this 1969 book as I was about to enter seminary. He called it Black Theology and Black Power. It was really about the black church and about God's uh, presence in the world. And it's considered to be the founding textbook of, of liberation theology. As you might suspect, it turned the dominant and traditional uh, theological world upside down, or should I say right side up. Critics and scholars didn't quite know what to make of it, and so naturally when you don't understand something, you kind of label it as being out of the mainstream of established ideas or philosophies or theologies. But what these scholars failed to say was that Dr. Cone's liberation theology, and you'll find this when you Google it up, his liberation theology was more in line with Karl Barth and Paul Tillich, but it also represented the very spirit and substance of the Holy Bible. They didn't say that, but that's what it was. I think we have a slide here. This is what I gleaned from his writings, and this is what it's all about tonight. The essence of biblical revelation is to be found in the knowledge that God is identified with the most vulnerable and persecuted of our society and has made the condition of the oppressed God's own condition, and by becoming the oppressed one, capital O's, by becoming the oppressed one in Jesus Christ, the human race is made to understand that God is known where human beings experience humiliation and suffering. Liberation is not an afterthought, but the very essence of divine activity. Now, my brothers and sisters, this was the first time 50 years ago that someone dared to put in writing what we in the African-American community knew all along. You see, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached it, and millions heard his message. But finally, someone had the audacity to articulate the character and nature of God and the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ in words that caused the tables in the temple to be overturned. I wish I had somebody to witness here with me tonight. You know, in the black church, I'd call you out right about now. It calls the tables in the temple to be overturned in the courtyard. And let me, let me just, I share this piece of my history with you because there's a reason. And I'll go back four ways. I was a child of the civil rights movement. I watched one day as my father was arrested at a lunch counter in Houston, Texas, along with many other students and activists because they didn't serve Negroes at that counter. I remember very well as a young child traveling many summers with my family to my mother's home in West Palm Beach, Florida, knowing that as we made our way from Texas through segregated Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Florida itself, there were only a limited number of places that we could stop to get gas or even use a restroom. When we ran out of food that we had prepared, we ate in the colored section of bus stations in Baton Rouge and in Tallahassee and other cities. We slept in boarding houses owned by people who looked like us because we couldn't stay in hotels. I never went to an integrated school until I got to seminary. And in all those years, I witnessed firsthand the marches, 
the protests, the beatings, and the persecution inflicted upon my African-American brothers and sisters. But I can tell you that in the midst of all the suffering of my people, there was a saving grace that prevented me and others like me from becoming bitter and angry. You know, when you see persecution, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know there's a tendency to, to want to lash back. It's a tendency to become bitter. Well, that was a saving grace in my life and countless thousands of others like me, and it was the black church. You see, that's why the civil rights movement began in the church. You know, when they arrested Rosa Parks on December the 5th, you know, they, and, and they had a meeting that they wanted to go and get her out of jail, and it just so happened that was this new preacher in town whose church was big enough to hold most of the black community, and his name was Martin Luther King. So let's go to his church and decide what we're going to do. So it was started in the church because the church taught me and others like me, that there was a God who sat high but looked low. A God whose eye was not only on the sparrow, but whose eye was also on me. A God who, as Mary says in her soliloquy found in Luke, looks with favor on the lowliness of his people who has brought down the powerful and mighty from their thrones, who has lifted up the lowly, who has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Not only did the church introduce me to this God, but also to a Savior who from the very beginning proclaimed his mission as he Stood. Can't you see him standing in the, in the synagogue that day, in the temple one day, and he, he opens up the scroll and he reads it from the book of Isaiah, saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and all the eyes were fixed upon him, he said, today, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, what James Cone was writing about, the church had already engraved into my mind and into my heart. It was part of my upbringing. And now it was out there in the open, let loose this thing called liberation theology, let loose for the world to know. Here was a message that represented where I had come from and who I was, what I had been taught to believe, a message that my professors couldn't understand and definitely did not want to hear. And I can also tell you that this movement almost got me kicked out of school because I just decided one day in Dr. Cooper's class, I, I know he has to either be deceased now or he's 140 years old, but anyway, <laughs> He did not want to hear about liberation theology. And me and my, my brother, J.D. Phillips, we were the only two African Americans in the class. We thought that it would be good to force liberation theology upon them. That's what you do when you're young and in seminary, you know. So, so we com commandeered the class. I had him go stand at the door so no one could come in or anyone could leave while I decided to go over liberation theology. And when I finished my half of it, I went and stood at the door and he came back and finished the rest of the lecture. And when it was over, we had filled the whole hour and Dr. Cooper said, class dismissed. 
I just knew I was going home then. But Dean Quillian called me to his office uh, and told both of us, don't do that again. But you see, that was the sign of the times. Dr. Cohn said he traced his turning point and the inspiration to write about liberation theology to the Detroit riots of 1967, where clashes between mostly black residents from Detroit and the police resulted in the deaths of 43 people. He writes, I heard the voices of black blood crying out to God and to humanity. I share all of that with you tonight as a backdrop to what I'm sharing with you in tonight's message, just because just as James Cone experienced a turning point in his life with the riots in Detroit, I also experienced a, a profound transformation in my own life when I came to know the movement known as Christ at the checkpoint. I will be the first to admit that my knowledge of Christ and the checkpoint over a decade ago was very limited. Even as I went about hosting several groups to and from the Holy Land while serving as a bishop here in Oklahoma. You see, our itinerary went where the tourists went, to places that conformed to a nice and neatly arranged travel package. And then one day, Daryl Cates asked me if I knew anything about the movement known as Christ at the checkpoint. After confessing my ignorance, he asked me if I would be interested in taking a group to an upcoming gathering that would be held in Bethlehem. Uh, uh, Jeremy reminds me that it was 2012, I think the second such meeting. I promised him that I would go just so I could experience it for myself. So we got a small group together of young pastors and, and we went to Bethlehem. Now in case you're wondering why I went through all the pains of telling you about James Cone and my past and what it has to do with Christ at the checkpoint, it is this. I want you to know that I have credentials to know what suffering and hardship is when I see it. I know oppression and subjugation when I experience it. And I know injustice because I have lived it. And when I come face to face with any new experience, especially the new experience of being at the checkpoint, everything James Cone wrote about in his liberation theology came back to me like a, like a rushing tide of emotions. I ask myself, why is it that I've never seen or known of this movement before? Why have I been shielded from experiencing this hidden suppression? And the answer was easy, because no one, no one wanted me to see this. No one wanted me or my group to be witnesses to this inhumanity heaped upon another, and at least of all to see it with our own eyes. The images are just as clear now as they were in 2012. The wall, the wall, the barbed wire, the soldiers with their weapons drawn, the crowds of people standing in long, long lines trying to get from one side to the other in the blistering heat or the shivering cold for hours just to make a meager living. Literally, one way in and one way out. And the way that most of them were treated told me that I didn't have to be Palestinian to remind me of what this was like. It was a page ripped right out of the 1960s that I knew so well. 
And like Cone, I could literally hear the voices of those people crying out, how long, how long? But just as the church came to my rescue in the 1960s, I have come to realize that the one thing that keeps this movement from bitterness and resentment and anger, which could easily beset us, is this. We proclaim Christ at the checkpoint. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We proclaim Christ at the checkpoint. And I, I don't know if you know how important that is. Let, let, me, let me tell you, a, few, a moment ago I told you that we got a group together from Oklahoma to come and see for ourselves what Christ at the checkpoint was about. Now, you need to know it wasn't as easy as it sounded, not even to the bishop, okay? Once I made up my mind that we were going, I think I heard from people all over Oklahoma and beyond Oklahoma, clergy and lay, who had found out that we were going and wanted to tell me how bad an idea it was. They were upset with me that I would do this as the bishop. Sometimes it's good to be the bishop. Yeah. It's good to be the bishop. They were upset with me. And, and when the speakers for this week were announced, I got phone calls and emails from a lot of people questioning me why I had consented to even being here. And this should come as no surprise to many of you because I know in this room that many of you have at some point been maligned, criticized, and probably even threatened if you had any association to do with these conferences. I've just come to tell you the truth tonight. In one email response, I, I said, why is it that you choose to ignore or not open your eyes to all sides of the issues of what's taking place at the checkpoint? Why is it that you would want to discredit what we do or say here? Let me tell you, these years have taught me something. Have taught me that one of the things people do when they are unwilling or refusing to be educated on something is they change the narrative. I see a few here. Yeah, they change the narrative. You know, that's, uh, you know, if you look it up, it's, it will say changing the narrative is a technique designed to alter the framework within which events are perceived and interpreted. Well, I broke that down to the least common denominator, and it's a tactic that's used to influence people into believing something different from what's actually happening or taking place. They change the narrative. Let me give you an example. Not a popular one, but it's one that's true. The National Football League, the NFL, finds itself in a difficult place now because some players are refusing to stand during the playing of the national anthem. What began as a protest against the brutality and treatment of people of color by some police, not all, by some, has now evolved into a national debate over disrespect for the flag, lack of patriotism, and supposedly anti-military, anti-police sentiments. You see, the narrative was changed from what it was intended to be to what most Americans now think it has become. The protest was never, never about the flag. It was never about patriotism or disrespect for the military or police in general. It was designed to bring attention to the injustices of how young men and women of color were being treated. In fact, it's the, the one who did it first, Colin Kaepernick, he had a great friend, a military, ex-military friend, 
who gave him some advice. He said, I respect what you're doing, but let me give you this piece of advice. Instead of sitting on the bench while the anthem is played, it would be better if you would kneel. It would be more respectful if you would kneel while the anthem is played. And so when they change the narrative, the original purpose gets lost and we go back and forth. I say that to you tonight because for many years people have tried to change the narrative of Christ at the checkpoint. We've been called radical, subversive, anti-U.S., anti-Israel, everything else under the sun. But the one thing that presents a stumbling block to those who would lead others to believe something different is that it is Christ at the checkpoint and no one else. As long as we keep Christ at the checkpoint, our movement speaks for itself. In Christ, there is no east or west. No south or north, no Jew, no Palestinian, no Gentile. And you know, I've got to thinking, if the truth be told, it's not so much about us that they're having a problem with. I think it's this liberating Christ who stood in the temple that day and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release and let the oppressed go. I think it's that Christ that they are having problems with. In liberation theology, and we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, there is something about this movement and this man that they just simply don't understand or are unwilling to understand. On the one hand, his mission was to let the oppressed go free. And yet, on the other hand, the manner in which he would do it baffles most people. Let me explain. On the last night that Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he knew what was about to happen. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. He knew that his disciples were going to desert him and that he would be put to death. Yet in John's gospel, the 13th chapter, and verse 34, he says, a new command, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. So what we have here for the people beyond this room is something of a conflict, a, a paradox. They, they can't quite wrap their minds around. On the one hand, this, this Christ, the liberator, says, I have come to set you free. But on the other hand, the manner in which he will achieve this, this mission is by loving those, even those who are oppressing us. They don't understand that, but it's the very nature of the Christ that we serve. I have no doubt in my mind that one day, maybe not in my generation, but that one day the wall will come down. I have no doubt that one day the checkpoint will be no more. One day, the oppressed will go free, and we are here in these three days to once again state our faith, increase our resolve in a loving God and in a liberating Savior who will help us to accomplish these things. Let, let me end by saying this. The reason I have no doubt about it, let me, let me tell you of an experience I had a little less than two years ago. On August the 13th, 1961, the Berlin Wall was erected to prevent immigrants from escaping East Germany. The professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, all the people, they, they saw what was about to happen, and so they were increasingly going to the West. 
And so they, they built this wall on August the 13th, 1961. It, it was a visible reminder and a symbol of the Cold War. And for those of you who are too young to know this, the, the crossing point that was given, the name was given by the Western Allies as the best known crossing point from Berlin, from the east to the west. It was called Checkpoint Charlie. You all remember, I see your head. See, I, I got some people that got hair as gray as mine. <laughs> Checkpoint Charlie, you remember it. It was a part of history. And just a couple of years ago, I had a chance to go to Berlin and witness what was there. The wall is no more. In fact, for those of you who have been, if you are planning to go, you will see a lot of souvenir shops around the wall. And in these souvenir shops, they have, they have crushed pieces of the wall and put them in little bags to be sold as souvenirs so you can have a piece of the wall. I bought two for my grandson and my granddaughter so they could have a piece of history in their hand. They, they, they would know nothing of the Berlin Wall or Checkpoint Charlie, but I, I bought them these souvenirs so they could keep for the rest of their lives. And Checkpoint Charlie is now a tourist attraction and a museum in the Dalem neighborhood of Berlin. One day, maybe not long enough, short enough for me to see it, but one day, that wall is going to come down. One day, my grandchildren will have the wall from Berlin and the wall from the checkpoint, and it will be a lasting memorial to the countless thousands that suffered through it and went through it in our lifetime. One day, they, as well as us, will be free. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, We pause now knowing that indeed you are at work. The scriptures say a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. We can't even begin to fathom what your timetable is, but tonight we seek hope. We seek reassurance that indeed one day those walls that are erected will come down one day the checkpoint that draws us to it will be no more. And one day we'll just make another step toward freedom, another step in a long journey where we must move on to free others as well. May your blessings be upon this conference this week. May your light of hope shine bright within their hearts to let them know that the truth be told, you are the one that brings us here. You are the checkpoint. And we have all the confidence and the assurance in the world that your will will be done. That liberation is not an afterthought, but it represents your divine presence in all of humanity toward the oppressed. We pray this now in the name of our God, our liberating Savior, and the power of the Holy Spirit. In his name, let us all say amen. amen. Be thankful to the Uber driver who gave me the time to sit down. Thank you. Oh.